Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello, and welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast, Explainer Episode 72. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to the discussion today. Well, hello. Good day, everyone. I'm Luke Wake. I'm an attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation. I'm the chair of the Regulatory Transparency State and Local Regulation Working Group, which is a mouthful. Uh, Today, I have the pleasure of moderating this discussion on a subject that is sure to have many PTA mothers across the country in arms. It's a particularly uh, sensitive subject, uh, a delicate subject in my view, but undoubtedly an important one in this brave new world we live in. The issue is whether the issue we will be discussing today is whether and to what extent public schools should be communicating with parents about their children's uh, gender identity choices or or hiding things such as a child's request to be referred to uh, as a different gender or say a request uh, for a biological boy to use a girl's bathroom or a biological girl named say Helen to ask to be referred to as maybe a Hank. Uh, or a child presenting in other ways as, as different from their their gender at birth. So, of course, these are difficult difficult issues. And in today's society, everyone has thoughts on these subjects. I certainly do. But my thoughts don't matter for much. To, um, to quote uh, the dude from The Great Lebowski, uh, well, that's just your opinion, man. My, my opinion, it doesn't matter for a whole lot because I'm not an expert on this subject. But we have today two great experts, luckily, who've put a lot of thought into these issues, uh, both on the policy side and on the legal side. In fact, uh, you know, the Regulatory Transparency Project will soon publish their forthcoming white paper on the subject, which makes a case that schools should not be hiding these sort of information from children or, or from parents. Um, and so today's conversation is sort of a sneak peek on that. First, we have Jonathan Butcher. He is the Will Skillman Senior Research Fellow in education policy at Heritage Foundation. He is the author of Splintered, Critical Race Theory and the Progressive War on Truth. He co-edited and and wrote chapters in The Critical Classroom, discussing the racial prejudice that comes from the application of critical race theory in K-12 schools. And he has researched and testified on education policy across the United States. He also happens to be on a board in South Carolina for public charter school districts statewide. Uh, And he has a very long CV here, so (laughs) we could go on. But second, we have Jonathan Riches. So two Jonathans today. Uh, Jonathan Riches is the vice president for litigation at Goldwater Institute's Sharf Norton Center for Constitutional Litigation. He's also the general counsel for the Institute. Jonathan litigates in federal and state trial and appellate courts in the areas of economic liberty, regulatory reform, free speech, taxpayer protections, public labor issues, government transparency, school choice, and other issues. So that is uh, an introduction to our great speakers today. And I'd like to kick things off here right now to Jonathan Butcher, who again is, I think, really the the expert on on the policy issues we're dealing with here. And Jonathan, would you mind kind of walking me through the, the nature of this issue that we're dealing with here today and, and give us sort of the top level thoughts? Sure. And thanks, Luke. So the issue before parents is that there is a question of when a child comes to school and has been um, convinced by what has really been an onslaught of information and um, persuasion about whether or not they were born in the wrong body. And they tell a teacher at school that they want to go by a different name or that they want to assume, quote, a different gender, whether or not that teacher should then communicate with the parents. What the left has said, what gender advocates have said for many years is, look, this should be a student's decision of whether or not the parents should be informed. Do you want a uh, live son or a dead daughter? Right, And the claim is that there's a higher likelihood of uh, suicide if parents are informed, if a child wants to assume a different gender because the child would have told the parents on their own. Um, 
if it was something the child was comfortable with. Now, this mindset is completely wrong. And there are several reasons, right? So the first is that these are minor children who we are talking about here. So 18 or under, these are minor kids, okay? And so when you send your child off to school, parents have to sign a form so that the um, uh, teachers, if the teachers can give them cough drops, right? Or aspirin, okay? And when a child wants to change their, again, quote, gender, and I'm going to explain why I use quote so often when I refer to that term, so when they want to change their gender, you're talking about very serious uh, medical interventions that would follow, okay? In California in particular, the San Diego Unified School District actually has listings on its webpage for local planned parenthood offices that will administer, okay, puberty-blocking drugs and hormone interventions that will then, in many cases, permanently change a child's biology. Okay. They are, uh, they are irreversible. Then sometimes students, when they are affirmed, young people, when they are affirmed, they will pursue surgeries that will then, uh, definitely permanently change their bodies. Okay. So you are suddenly saying to minor children who we do not allow to self-diagnose strep throat, ear infection, even depression or anxiety, without seeing a medical prof professional first, we're allowing them to say they were born in the wrong body and then be affirmed and then permanently change themselves, okay? So just in terms of medical science, okay, this is wrong. I would add that there are actually Supreme Court cases that have ruled that young people, minor children, uh, do not have the wherewithal to make medical decisions for themselves. And I, my colleagues at Heritage uh, just wrote a paper about this, including uh, Sarah Partial Perry, uh, who cited the case uh, uh, in that instance. Um, so I think uh, you have the sort of the, the moral and medical related evidence here. You have uh, Supreme Court rulings on it. And then in terms of the policy, I would uh, point straight to FERPA, right? FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Uh, this is a federal law that uh, it makes sure that parents have access to their child's data, any information about their child while at school. So when a child says they are born in the wrong body, that does not negate FERPA, okay? Parents should still have access to information about their children, including their health information about those children. And last thing I'll say, and then I'm happy to turn it to John, um, is that when the other side comes back and says, well, if we do this, then uh, parents may abuse these children, right? The parents may uh, suddenly uh, have, um, you know, in their anger or disappointment or whatever, uh, uh, enact violence on their children. Well, the fact is that teachers are still uh, mandatory reporters, right? They still have the responsibility, uh, no matter what the student may tell them, okay, of uh, to uh, report to the authorities whether or not there's the suspicion of abuse or neglect in a home. So that is still there. That is there before the child says they were born in the wrong body. It is there after the child says they were born in the wrong body. So uh, I think that the evidence that you have a neglectful or perhaps even an abusive home would be there um, really even before a child comes and makes this report um, about how they feel about their sex uh, going forward. So there are a number of issues, uh, both related to um, the law, both to medicine as well as morally, why it is so important that schools not become a wedge uh, in between parents and their children. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, Jonathan Rich's if you have, I, I definitely want to make time to, to, after we sort of delve into the policy side of this a little bit more to talk about the legal side. I know that's that's really uh, where you spent more time thinking about. But do you have anything sort of initially that you want to respond to uh, from Butcher or or any thoughts at all before we? The one thing I'd say on the policy side, and it overlaps somewhat with the legal side, is this this tension between government authorities mandating what they feel is right for a child 
versus uh, a parent's right to direct the care and upbringing of their children is not a new phenomenon. Um, you know, it goes back since the founding of our country and the cases that have made their way up to the Arizona, or I'm sorry, to the United States Supreme Court um, have been in a whole variety of contexts where the state has passed a law or, a, you know, a district has taken a particular action that when you really distill what's going on, you have government authorities on the one hand saying, we know what's best for your child. And then you have parents on the other saying, um, well, no, you don't. Um, or at least, um, I have a right, um, uh, both, a both an inherent right and a legal right uh, to, re to direct the care and upbringing of, of my child. And I know, I know we'll get a chance to talk about some of those cases. Absolutely. So, uh, but you're right. So there is this phenomena in government we trust, I suppose, that, that you're, you're dealing with uh, an element of that uh, in these conversations. So, but that, that leads me to um, some follow-up questions because I want to make sure that when, when I hear conversations about these issues, uh, it, especially as someone who's not as steeped in the policy debates and is not as steeped in actually what's happening on the ground in these schools, I want to make sure we're clear about the the scope and the nature of the, this controversy because I, I you know we need to sort of firm, d define the the parameters of what we're talking about. So, Jonathan, if I understood you um, correctly a moment ago, you were saying that this is not just a matter of, you know, a child going to school dressed one way and you know, switching into a dress or something else once they get there or wanting to be called by a different name. It's some of these school districts are actually facilitating medical uh, medical care, if you will, or you know, changes to their bodies. They're, they're, they're actually facilitating that and, and allowing that to, to fly under the radar without any any parental knowledge or involvement. So as far as we know, um, schools should not be administering these kinds of puberty blockers and hormone treatments that I mentioned to you. However, because students can talk to a school counselor uh, without, the, without their parents' knowledge, the counselor can then affirm the child when they say they were born in the wrong body. And in states like California, New Jersey, um, and elsewhere, it, it actually is happening, right? That these students are being socially affirmed. It's what it's called, social affirmation. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I mentioned the San Diego Unified School District's you know, webpage that had all those links to the Planned Parenthood offices, that's why that's so significant, right? They're making it easy for a child to gain access to these sorts of drugs that are going to permanently change their bodies. Um, our uh, friends over at Parents Defending Education actually keep track of the number of schools and the number of school districts that have policies that say you may not inform parents when a child comes and says they were born in the wrong body. So we're talking well over a thousand, we're almost close to 2000 school districts now and close to 20,000 schools within those districts where the policy is that teachers cannot inform parents or it's optional, in which case, more often than not, the evidence shows that they are just affirming a child, right? They're just, when a child comes and says, you know, I was born in the wrong body, I want you to call me by this name, and I don't want you to tell my parents, uh, they simply are affirming the child and passing them along. I mean, we have evidence um, of other districts where this is happening because the ACLU has published the letters that they have sent to the districts saying that they cannot inform parents. So the ACLU is actually, you know, in favor of these secrecy policies. They want the secrecy to continue. And that's remarkable. And they'll even cite FERPA, right, in their letters with a complete misreading of what FERPA is all about. FERPA is not there to protect the child. It is there to protect the family's access to the child's information, right? It's not there so that the child can hide something. It's there so that the family doesn't have information that's being kept from them uh, on school grounds. And that's what I think is so significant about this. Well, then we had better, I think, ask Jonathan Riches to, if you don't mind, Jonathan, to you know, give walk us through a little bit more about FERPA and 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 the arguments, the, the legal controversy surrounding FERPA, because you know there's, there's always you know two sides to every coin, and the ACLU has has its arguments, and I want to make sure we're very clear in explaining to people what FERPA is uh, and and the sort of competing lines of thought around the, the legal issues here. 
Um, yeah, so FERPA is a federal law that um, ultimately is intended to provide parents with access to educational records. And so, um, um, you know, when you have some people arguing that the law is intended to keep parents in the dark, it's pretty clear that the, the primary provisions of these statutory protections are the exact opposite, is to allow uh, parents with a federal statutory um, ability to receive education records pertaining to their own kids. Um, so that's sort of where the, the controversy is between, you know, does a student have specific statutory private rights under the law um, or do the parents have a countervailing right to the education records? And I think a, a fair reading of it is is that, that the latter is really the, in both the letter and spirit of the law, um, is is what it's intended to protect. And has there been um, litigation on this subject? We, we haven't been involved. Um, our organization hasn't been involved in um, FERPA litigation, but I do know there's been some other cases um, throughout the country um, raising raising these various issues. Um, I, I want to uh, pivot back, if we can, to make sure you know talking talking about the policy side of this, because you know we, we could certainly talk more about the legal. Uh, issues, you know, again, I want to make sure that's, you know, sort of the tail end of this conversation as much as possible, because uh, I think we, we, we ought to you know, address the normative issue first. Right. And so one, one question I always ask when we're dealing with uh, the, with our regulatory transparency project in general is historically, we've always tried to, you know, shine a light on regulatory problems that are causing, you know, real, real problems for society, but without, any real benefits or where the benefits are, you know, uh, outweighed. But, uh, but we've also traditionally tried to find issues for which there's some opportunity for cross ideological agreement. Uh, some, I, I'm not sure that that exists here, but I, I'm curious, Jonathan, is there, is that, is, is that your view? Oh yeah, it, it absolutely is. In fact, surveys show that the idea that children, minor children, should be taught the concept of, quote, gender in elementary school is highly unpopular, highly unpopular among voters. There was even a New York Times survey a couple of years ago that found um, a disagreement with the idea that elementary age children should be taught the, the idea of, quote, gender even into middle school. There were um, uh, a higher share of respondents who opposed the idea. There are other surveys that have reflected the same thing. In particular, one of the least popular ideas is that a child can go to school, say they are of a different, quote, gender, and then participate in athletics. And so having boys participate in girls' athletics in K-12 schools is a very unpopular idea. So I do not think it is the case that you know, the U.S. is somehow split on this idea of using gender in school. That's that's not what the, the survey data shows. And so what we are seeing now is that these policies are actually being forced on families. So take, for example, what's happened in California. In California, the governor just signed a bill that says schools may not adopt policies that require teachers to inform parents when a child comes to school saying they were born in the wrong body. So it's now law in the state of California. And that is what makes it so concerning for the rest of the country, because there are, of course, more conservative governors who would not, you know, likely adopt such, uh, such a proposal. And so local districts might, which is why I gave you those numbers when we were talking a moment ago, right? You know, we have some 1900, right? Uh, public school districts, uh, we're getting close to 20,000 schools that are represented there that have adopted those policies themselves, which is what makes this a regulatory issue that likely would then need to be resolved in court if it's not resolved um, at the state house, because there are some states that have adopted laws saying you must, when you want to participate in sports, in athletics, in K-12 schools, it has to align with the biology as listed on your uh, birth certificate. In fact, uh, at the Heritage Foundation, we have released model legislation that actually says um, uh, a child, uh, teachers and uh, school personnel must address a child by the name, pronouns, and sex as listed on their birth certificate unless they get express permission from the parents. And that's already been adopted in, we're getting, I think, close to, um, we're upwards of half a dozen states that have done so. I know Arkansas uh, has done that and uh, Louisiana 
I know is considered, uh, uh, no, I, I, Louisiana actually did adopt it this year as well. So th- there's a, a, a struggle here because I think that uh, state lawmakers recognize what a threat this is to young people because, you know, once you have a young child, a minor age child, okay, cannot vote, cannot drive, probably just learned to tie their shoes a couple of years ago, and you're saying, oh, yes, you can now change your gender, the uh, long-term effects of the interventions, the medicines, and certainly we know what the surgeries cause because they usually involve some sort of amputation. But the medicines involved, um, a report uh, highly regarded coming out of the UK earlier this year uh, said a survey of the research evidence finds we do not know what the long-term outcomes are. And frankly, it is not safe because we don't know what this is going to do to young people. And so we should not have medical professionals performing these procedures. And again, uh, Europe is ahead of the U.S. on on this issue uh, because England and a couple of other countries uh, across the pond have actually prohibited uh, the use of uh, these puberty blockers and hormones or um, interventions on minor age children. And it's for that reason, because we simply do not know. The research does not tell us what the long-term effects are going to be. Well, surely the choice uh, of a child and a, a medical care provider to enable that is is one matter. And I, I could sort of compartmentalize that as uh, maybe a more si- significant or more serious sort of question mark. But with regard to, let's say, a school that is just saying, we're going to adopt this policy. We're not going to tell the parents when a child asks to be referred to as a different gender name or dress differently. There's obviously still concerns there, but it's a different nature of concern. And and if their justification is uh, the potential for, uh, is is the justification ultimately about the potential for backlash from parents who respond negatively to that? Is that, that's ultimately what's driving that? Is, is there more to the rationale? Again, they are still wards. I mean, they're still wards of their parents. I mean, these are, again, minor age children. And so if we are going to abide not just by the letter, but the spirit of these Supreme Court decisions, uh, right, we've got Troxel v. Granville, Meyer v. Nebraska, Wisconsin v. Yoder, you know, all of these are decisions that in various ways say you have the right to raise a family, right, and to raise children. Uh, We have states adopting parent bills of rights that say that a child is a, uh, a, a parent is a child's primary caregiver, and the state cannot interfere with that um, except by the least restrictive means necessary, you know, the whole strict scrutiny thing. I won't pretend to be a lawyer. John's got that covered. Um, so this, there, there are already laws that are protecting this relationship between the parent and the child. So what schools are doing when they adopt provisions, their own provisions, saying that they will keep medical information a secret from parents, they're violating both the letter and the spirit of not just parent bills of rights, but also what I believe the Supreme Court has ruled in the case of uh, the freedom of individuals to raise a family. We should not have to ask permission to find out information about a minor child at school. We should not have to ask permission. Well, let's let's ask John Riches then as the as the legal expert. Um, I mean, is, is that your take? And can you walk us through the, the line of Supreme Court cases that Butcher is referring to here and 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 outline sort of the parameters of, of that constitutional debate? Or, or do you see there being a real debate on this subject? Well, there certainly is a real debate on, on the subject, but um, I think one thing that's not really up for debate is the United States Supreme Court has been crystal clear that the United States Constitution under the 14th Amendment protects a parent's right to direct the care and upbringing of their of their children. So this goes back um, almost exactly a century ago. Um, the seminal case, there was one slightly before it, but the seminal case is a case called Pierce v. Society of Sisters. And this involved an Oregon law that required all children in the state to attend um, public school. So, you know, kids couldn't attend sectarian or, or religious schools or any other, um, uh, any other non-public school. There were some, some limited exem- exceptions, but that was, that was the thrust of the law. And so, um, so uh, uh, Society of Sisters, who ran a, a religious school, brought a case. Interestingly, I know we mentioned the ACLU earlier on some of these statutory FERPA questions, but the ACLU actually represented um, the plaintiffs in that case. And 
um, or at least we're, we're, um, we're on the legal team. Uh, but the case goes up to the United States Supreme Court on this question as to whether the state of Oregon could uh, require attendance at public schools. And the Supreme Court said, no, they can't. Uh, and there's a great line in the case where the court says that the child is not the mere creature of the state. And then goes on to say that the 14th Amendment uh, protects um, a parent's right to direct their child's education. Now, since that was decided uh, about 100 years ago, there's been a number of cases that have built on that and reiterated that holding. I think Jonathan mentioned Wisconsin v. Yoder. Um, um, a recent one in 2020 was Troxel v. Granville. So that involved a Washington law that allowed any third party to petition for child visitation rights. Uh, in this particular case, um, a, uh, a father had passed away and the grandparents wanted to have visitation rights for the child. So they petitioned for visitation rights and the mother, the living mother objected. So this went up to the Washington Supreme Court and then ultimately to the United States Supreme Court. And um, there the U.S. Supreme Court reiterated in very strong terms the central holding of Pierce. Um, there's a great line in it where the court said, uh, the interest of parents in the care, custody, and control of their children is perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized by this court. So, um, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has been very clear for over 100 years that uh, the Constitution protects parental rights. Um, lower courts have have um, built on that and have added additional uh, parental rights uh, protections. And of course, the way we're seeing it come up sort of commonly now is in this situation where parents, um, uh, I'm sorry, school districts, or in some cases, the state will affirmatively say that parents do not have a right to information about something like a child's gender identity. Um, of course, that's not the only way um, it comes up, um, but it's a common way. For example, we're involved in a, in a case out in the state of Maine where um, a school counselor gave a 13-year-old girl a chest binder, which is a device meant to um, flatten, flatten the chest, and um, started to refer to the child by uh, different pronouns and a different name and affirmatively hid that information from the parents. So we brought a federal case representing the mother in that case, Amber Levine. Um, but there's other cases. You know, th there was a case um, involving a school policy where there was a prohibition on parents communicating with coaches of their kids' sports teams, you know, and, and um, is that prohibition on communication interfering with this fundamental 14th the Amendment right of parents to direct the upbringing of their kids? I think the United States Supreme Court um, at some point in the near future is going to grant review on one of these 14th Amendment cases um, uh, and, and, you know, set out... I think as they did in 2020, but perhaps even even a little further than that, set out the contours of of this legal protection. Well, and if the Supreme Court grants review on one of those cases, do you think the the question that they will be wrestling with is whether or not we're applying strict scrutiny, or do you think that the question more will be does the specific school policy we're dealing with uh, meet the narrowly tailoring and and and, and all of those requirements for strict scrutiny. I mean, how, how do you see that sort of case playing out? Yeah, I think the standard of review is going to be really important uh, when we're dealing with these sorts of cases. What is the proper standard of review? So I think that um, has to be um, resolved. Um, I think, you know, and this is total speculation now, but it seems to me that when a state like California goes so far as to say that school districts can't, have um, policies that require parental notification, that's a big enough deal to get the court's attention just on the facts. I mean, kind of setting aside, you know, what are going to be the specific, um, the specific um, uh, legal questions on which they grant review. I think something like that is, could get the court's attention. A similar situation is happening in the state of New Jersey. Um, it wasn't a state statute, but the state attorney general interpreted existing state law 
to essentially say that school districts in that state that had per- passed affirmative parental notification policies were violating state statute that purportedly protected a student's right to privacy. Um, and I know there's been a federal challenge to that. So I think I think the cases to watch, who knows the fact pattern that will ultimately make it up, but I think those are probably some likely candidates when you have statewide action like that. But you guys have mentioned New Jersey and California a lot. And I understand I'm in California and, and they say here, as goes California, so goes the nation. That's always the concern. God help us, Luke. I, I hope <laughs> that's not the case uh, on a number of uh, basically almost any issue. It's, it's California. California is usually a bad model. There, there, there probably is some exception out there. Um, but, but in any event, when it comes to uh, these issues, though, it's not – as I understand correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is not necessarily just a deep blue state issue. Isn't this coming up in maybe some states that you wouldn't expect um, and and maybe without the state legislature mandate, mandating it? Kansas oh, yeah. is one. They're just, yeah, Kansas is one that I've found examples. And the parents defending Ed, I mentioned their list to you. I mean, they've got examples from, from really all over the U.S., yeah, and a lot of this could be individual school district um, policies too. Of course, that uh, that with the pol- the district's policy says we are going to affirmatively hide information from parents, and that can happen in you know any state, red, blue, or otherwise. But whether we're talking about the sort of policy question or the or the legal question, I mean, I think for the sake of this. They're sort of interconnected in a way. Uh, the rationale for the poli- for the school district adopting the policy matters a lot. So whether and let's set aside for the moment whether it's mandated from the state legislature or just something that the the school district is adopting on a discretionary basis. Let's say they've adopted the policy, and their rationale is, as I think you've articulated, Jonathan Butcher, that the, the, the reason behind these are concerns about the child's well being, uh, concerns about the potential negative reactions from a parent and and a child maybe uh, maybe the potential for abusive reactions, but but even setting that aside, uh, concerns about the potential for a child to um, react and spin into some sort of you know depression, suicidal situation. Uh, if those are the nature of the concerns, um, you know the, the question that one might ask is, well, what's wrong with the school? taking uh, a position that we're going to err on the side of protecting the child. Now that I think that's sort of the devil's advocate here, but what is your response there? Well, because the, the school's responsibility is not to keep a secret. It's to report it to the authorities, right? The schools, if the school is afraid of parental abuse, they need to report that to the authorities, not keep it a secret, right? There, there is, there's no justification legal or otherwise for a school to keep, information about a minor child strictly a secret to themselves, right? They should either be reporting the potential for harm or actual harm to the police or to child protective services or to a medical professional, right? There's no reason for a school to say, well, we've got this thing we know about the kid. We're just not going to tell anybody. And like, they, they certainly won't do that with a report card. They shouldn't do it with uh, a child's uh, uh, help. I, I would add to the research increasingly shows that these claims of suicidality are false, right? So my colleague at the Heritage Foundation, Jay Green, did a study just two years ago looking at the rates of suicide among young people uh, in states that have made it um, more difficult to access uh, puberty blockers and found that did not inc- increase suicide, right? Uh, when they had, there were restrictions on the access to it. Um, and actually the suicide rates are actually higher in some of the other states. And then we just had a new study that just came out of London that uh, also found that suicide rates did not increase when they made it more difficult to access puberty blockers. So this claim here that we're sort of playing games with kids' lives is is simply false. And I think in the, the larger context, what the advocates of, quote, gender are after is civil rights law. Right, that's always been the big question of what they are after. They want to equate uh, gender with race and immutable characteristics, ethnicity, country of origin, which is why the Biden administration is trying to change sex in Title IX of the Education Amendments to the Civil Rights Act in 1972. They're trying to change sex to mean sexual orientation and gender identity. 
That's that they're trying to do this by rule right now. Okay. And the goal then is to equate gender with civil rights so that if you deny or if you disagree uh, with the idea that gender is a thing, okay, you can be accused of a civil rights violation and then you can be sent to jail. So they can send, they want to be able to send people to jail. Okay. If you disagree with the idea of gender, that is the ultimate aim. Fortunately, just with this rule change, uh, we've got half of U.S. states, I think, represented in lawsuits where it's been enjoined. And so the Biden administration is counting on the fall when this would go into effect. But uh, we already have uh, courts, I mean, Louisiana, uh, Kentucky, uh, there are a couple of others that have uh, have enjoined this. So this is not going to apply. And uh, I would suspect that, you know, depending on what happens in the fall, that, um, uh, you know, there will be efforts to uh, to rescind this. Well, so so it sounds like yet another example of um, you know, the federal administration, anyways, uh, trying to to contort and 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 sort of reinterpret statutes in a way that advances uh, you know political agenda one way or the next. Um, but let, let me let me shift back to the policy front here. Is is part of your concern that these these sort of policies that inhibit parents from actually knowing about what the kid is saying at school and on these matters? Is the concern partly that that's actually going to actually impede the child maybe from from getting help that they need uh, for either dealing with gender dysmorphia concerns or other issues, anxiety, depression, whatever that might be? I mean, is that is that an element of the conversation? Well, it's sure a part of it. I mean, I think the biggest concern is that you're interfering with parental rights. I mean, that, that's what these secrecy policies are doing. You're interfering with a, a parent's ability to raise their child according to the way they see fit. It is, though, also true that research has found a significant overlap between the diagnoses of anxiety, depression, even autism in some cases, and children who say they were born in the wrong body, which is why when you socially affirm them, along those lines and do not provide them access to counselors, therapists, or, you know, medical doctors, choices and decisions that should be made in concert with families and usually are, okay, then yes, you are setting a child up for, um, you know, significant long-term harm. Um, you know, I would add here, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to miss, miss this. This is really important. And it's sort of lingering behind everything that we've talked about here. The idea of gender is a slippery concept. We are not talking about a hard and fast idea here. Okay. Sex is what you were born as you were born with the ability to produce sperm or eggs with very minor, uh, cases in which um, there is some sort of uh, dysfunction, right? Uh, when someone may be born. But nevertheless, even in cases where there is a biological anomaly, uh, you are still, absent that anomaly, able to produce sperm or eggs. So it's not as though you are born a number three here, okay? You are born male or female. In cases there are anomaly, uh, even though the biology is not functioning the way it was designed to, Okay, you are still born one or the other, right? Gender is an idea, okay? And gender advocates actually emphasize this that it is detached from the physical body. Gender is what you think you are. And the difficulty is is that if you think that you were a girl when you were born with the ability to produce sperm, you are detaching reality, okay? from what someone is thinking in their head. And that is why these policies have such significant impact, right? There is a snowball effect here between what can happen in terms of the health of a young child over time. Again, if someone has this confusion, all right, it largely resolves itself after someone uh, leaves puberty. In fact, research finds numbers as high as 90%. I've seen everywhere from about 68 to 90% of the time it resolves itself even in cases when it does not, okay, if someone chooses to live that way, when they are not a minor child, so long as they are not interfering on someone else's rights, then we're not asking for a prohibition here. Like I am not advocating for a prohibition on an adult, right? If they want to, if they're a male and they want to dress as a woman, not asking for a prohibition on that. I would, however, prohibit them from using a girl's bathroom at any point, right? They should not have access to a girl's private spaces. And I'll give you a quick example here. Um, and this is an anecdote of data that we have about the assaults in private spaces. Just in uh, the upstate of South Carolina, not far from where I live, there was a person who said they were a girl, 
They went to a women's shelter and then violated the rules and were kicked out of that shelter. And then they assaulted and sent a guard to the hospital. The shelter then learned it was a male. It was a guy that did that. Okay. So you are allowing men into women's private spaces and significantly threatening them. Okay. But, uh, the, that has, you know, the, those issues are, uh, what we would be sort of accelerating if we allowed for this social affirmation of young children, right? The policies concerning adults and, uh, and their access to various things, wanting to dress like a woman, what have you, okay? That's separate. But when we are talking about children, there should be no question, right, that in the case of a parent who has no history or evidence or suspicion of abuse or neglect, right, they should have access to their child's information while they are at school. Okay. Yeah. So here, here's my question for you then. And, and I know we're kind of brushing up towards the end of this, this podcast. So uh, if you could maybe give this briefly, but my, my question is, and then I want to turn to Jonathan for a you know, legal thing here. The, you have proposed model legislation. Do you see any, under your ideal policy, are there any exceptional circumstances that would warrant non-disclosure at all? In terms of policy, I mean, the only policies that I can think of giving the mandated reporter laws would be cases in which um, there is evidence of abuse. And uh, it, but in, you know, that, you know, again, I, I think that e- that would have to be taken on a case by case basis, because if the abuse was happening before the child came to school and said they were, you know, born in the wrong body, that should be, a, ha- should have been addressed before. Um, if the abuse occurred after the child came to school. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I suppose then, yes, I mean, there would be the, the issue wouldn't be keeping that particular issue, a secret from parents. The issue would be addressing the abuse, right? Well, That's what the school is responsible for. for. For the moment. I mean, what we're just talking about, you know, a, a child who is, is exhibiting, you know, an especially fragile sort of state of existence and, and, and there's, there's heightened concern about their sort of emotional well being. Uh, and, and say they confide in a psychologist, you, you would still say, well, that, that needs to be, you know, disclosed to the parents or, or would you only have, have that disclosed to say they're asking to like go by a different name or something? I mean, I don't see why it should not, why, why it wouldn't be disclosed to a parent. That is, it is an issue of uh, mental health. I mean, you see, here's the thing. Gender advocates say gender is an idea, right? That means mm-hmm. that it's occurring in your head. Well, if it's an idea and occurring in your head, and if you are saying that when a child seeks uh, counseling or therapeutic services, that would be reported to a parent, well, then this would need to be reported to a parent as well. Okay. Well, I, and, and I want to ask Jonathan Riches here to uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll let you both of you guys give some closing thoughts here, but I want to make sure we, we have opportunity for just a little bit more Riches. What are your thoughts? Uh, and you have any, anything you want to add on the legal side of this? And particularly, I, I'm, I'm curious, do you see a way that these sort of policies could potentially pass muster as narrowly tailored in some way or, you know, those, those are my those are my questions here. Um, another interesting, I think, possibility on the legal front are some of the state statutes that Jonathan mentioned, um, parental bill of rights, for examples, which clarify the legal test as something like strict scrutiny or something exactly like strict scrutiny and then create a cause of action for parents. So I think there's going to be a lot of, I think when people talk about this and frankly, other legal issues, everyone's always talking about the federal courts and the United States Supreme Court. Um, but given some of these state statutes and the protections, the statutory protections they afford parents, I think there's there um, there already is, and I think there's going to be more um, state based litigation um, asserting those rights uh, and bringing claims under state statute. Um, so I think that's probably something to keep an eye on in terms of, are there policies that pass muster? Um, I think that goes to if, you know, obviously if there's evidence of, um, uh, as, uh, Jonathan Butcher was mentioning abuse or neglect or that, or that possibility, um, I think those are, uh, those are, you know, clearly, uh, lawful and would, would pass, would pass muster and as they should. I mean, that's the existing state of the law and there's mandatory reporting requirements, um, you know, um, and and then that becomes a law enforcement uh, question at that point uh, through proper investigation and adjudication. Well, I'm going to ask 
a closing question to both of you. Is there something about your position here that, that we haven't said already that you really wish people would understand? But you want me to ask you. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, on the legal, on the legal side, I think it does. Yeah, I think when people think about their rights and their fundamental rights, um, most Americans just sort of revert to the Bill of Rights and the first 10 amendments. And, you know, if it's not specifically right there in the first amendment, then the constitution doesn't protect those rights. But this is one of those situations and there's many others, but this is one of those situations where an unenumerated right is protected by the constitution, a right that the Supreme court has called perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized by the court. Um, and obviously in this case, it's the right of parents to direct the upbringing of, of their kids. So, um, I guess that's, that's just a plug for saying that, um, the constitution, um, is uh, a more robust vehicle than the rights protected by the first 10 amendments and courts have a fundamental role to play in restricting government action that violates our constitutional rights. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And then Jonathan uh, Butcher, any, any closing thought for us? Well, just that the ultimate aim here is to protect families. Uh, I think that families and their local public school exist in a community together, right? I mean, uh, these are high schools and uh, especially as you get elementary schools into middle schools and into high schools, they represent often the center of the communities where they exist. Uh, the idea here is not to create some sort of battle or conflict between schools and families. It should be something where the school, if it's looking out for the best interests of young people, should be acting in in concert with families when it comes to a child's health, right? They should be reporting any incident of concern, whether they fall on the playground, whether they, um, you know, exhibit, you know, signs that they may be depressed or how to fight with a friend at school. I mean, a teacher should be calling home and say, Hey, look, I want the best for your child. I saw something that makes me think there's, you know, there's something going on here. Well, you know, it could be a test could be, you know, again, something with the child sitting next to him at the desk and it should include, the idea that a child feels like they were born born in the wrong body, which is a highly problematic issue, right? This is something that we should be helping young people with, helping them to understand the complexities that go into growing up and what puberty looks like, right? And families have got to be at the center of that. We have to believe that parents know their children better than anyone else. And we have to make them a part of the solutions when it comes to their own young people. Well, look, I really appreciate both of you for you know, imparting your knowledge on me and, and, and hopefully all, all of the listeners out there. And I really look forward to seeing uh, you know, the published version of this white paper you guys are working on. I, I've gotten a sneak peek at it. And I'm excited by it. So looking forward to that. And with that, let's let's wrap up. But thank you, guys. And well, let's do this again. Thank Thanks, you, gentlemen. Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 